Um, yeah, actually, just as a reminder, this is being recorded. So all of the funny things Dr. Econ said, you can all rewind and, and look at again and again. Oh, I just made that up. All right. Um, actually, uh, I'll end up skipping over a few things just because um, uh, Dr. Econ's um, dealt with uh, some of these uh, sort of already. Um, one of the important things I want to remind everybody is that there's currently no – oh, I got both of them. All right. All right. There's currently no – on-label treatment for um, uh, XLH. So there's no FDA-approved treatment for XLH, even what we do as standard of care. Um, and so to that end, I'm going to skip a couple things and go straight into some of our discussion about why um, or how FGF23 causes disease. And I'm going to try to make it a little bit more clear uh, for some of the things that uh, we were showing you uh, before. Um, Dr. Econ's already uh, illustrated the um, short stature and um, bowed legs, and this is just a kid that I've seen with that. Um, and as you guys all know, we do have problems with both, um, not we, I don't, uh, bone pain and uh, insufficiencies, fractures or stress fractures or pseudo fractures, depending on what name your doctor uses for them, um, and poor fracture healing. And this is just an, an um, illustration of the tooth abscesses that some of you guys have had to deal with. Some of your kids may not have had to deal with them, but it's uh, pretty common. I've actually seen um, several adults who um, had to have their teeth all pulled before um, like before they were 20 because they were having such problems. And hopefully that has improved with the advent of fluoride in the water and all these other things, but we'll have to see. Um, and then between 30 and 75% of adults have enthesopathy, which is this calcification of joints and or of tendons and ligaments, and so you see calcifications. This is actually, I think, Carolyn's paper um, for uh, at the spine and sometimes um, at the uh, at the ankle, and you can see bone spurs there, and then um, osteoarthritis. And those, unfortunately, those two things, enthesopathy and osteoarthritis, are really the worst part of being an adult with XLH. And our medicine does nothing for that. Um, and so I think that's actually uh, an important in thing to consider when you're talking about being treated as an adult for XLH. Um, Dr. Econ sort of already went over this, and I just want to emphasize again that, as you said, the problem doesn't go away as adults. You still have phosphate problems. Um, but the skeletal disease severity is really, really variable, um, anywhere from, um, you know, minimal to no bowing in children to severe bowing in children and then in adults some of the adult parents of my xlh kids um, because i see both adults and kids um, some of them have no real symptoms and aren't really complaining of anything and don't want to be on treatment and some of them are miserable and so i think there's just this wide variation that is important to always um, remember um, for those of you who are who have XLH and when you have kids and you want to know, does my kid have XLH? The main things I do is, um, I think it's a lot cheaper than uh, going and doing the gene test in the kid, is to just look at their phosphorus level. But remember that 99% of the of the labs that you're going to get a phosphorus level in children are, or are in, are going to only provide an adult normal phosphate range. And I drew back the adult normal phosphate range in green here. Um, and this is actually from information from a uh, handout that the XLH network has. This is uh, one of the, directly from one of the uh, papers. Um, and down here in the this is this first part is about one month, and then this part is about up to a year. And you can see that the child normal range in purple here is higher than the adult normal range. And if a child has a phosphorus that's here in the adult normal range they get rickets. Their bones don't mineralize properly. And so just a few weeks ago, I saw a 15-month-old kid, and the lab had an adult normal range on it. And if it wasn't me looking at it, they, so they might have said, hey, this kid is normal. Um, but they uh, definitely were affected. And so I think that's actually really, really important. Um, one other thing about the inheritance pattern, and I think a lot of you guys know this, is that um, it's uh, frequently sporadic, which means sometimes mom and dad don't have it. 
um, or at least it's not known. And, and one really important evidence uh, or uh, really important factor is that both boys and girls are equally affected. There's a lot of talk, including some talk in the literature of maybe boys are more severely affected than girls, but when it's actually been studied formally and effectively, there is an equal amount of variation in boys and in girls with XLH. Um, and then I'm just going to skip over a couple things here. Um, so, uh, because there's a typo in that slide and Dr. Econ's already talked about it. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, one of the important things is that the PECS or FEX mutations, you'll hear people at Indiana often call it PECS and everybody else in the world except for maybe a few scattered people will call it FEX. That's an uh, uh, artifact of the discovery of the gene and um, adventures in naming things um, that have, uh, have continued. Um, but so just in case anybody gets confused about that, most people would call it FEX and it doesn't really matter. It's, um, FGF23 is made in the bone, and this is, I don't know why Dr. Econ showed uh, Dr. Carpenter's data instead of his own data, but this is Dr. Econ's own data, um, that XLH patients have higher um, FGF23 levels here in blue than the normal patients um, in con uh, purple for the controls. So what is FGF23? It's a hormone. Now, people who aren't endocrinologists don't always know what hormones are, other than it causes a lot of problems when your kids go through puberty, right? Um, both of my kids are in puberty. That's why I'm here today instead of at home. <laughs> so what is a hormone? So a hormone's like a message, okay? And it's not like an email message, you know, so this is, we have to go back further. This is the, like the postal service, right? So one part of the body sends a message to another part of the body. And so your post office box here, or your postal box here is like a receptor, okay? And that sends a signal and tells this guy there's something to do. Now, I know we don't mail things to the plumber to get something fixed. We want them fixed faster than that. Um, but that's because the kidneys are involved here, plumbing seemed appropriate to me. So how does this work for, for um, FGF23? Well, the bones are the place originating the signal, and we'll make our letter say FGF23 on it, right? And we still have our receptor mailbox, right? But our mailbox is in the kidney. And it is... Um, and it uses a receptor called uh, fibroblast growth factor receptors and a co-receptor called clotho, and the details of that are not important, but it's primarily on the kidney. Um, and so the message goes to the receptor and tells the kidney to do a few things. One, Dr. Econ's talked about calcitriol, or 125 vitamin D, the most active form of vitamin D. So FGF23 tells the kidney, well, don't make so much of that. We don't need so much of that. And it also tells the kidney, just put all that phosphorus in the urine. We don't need that either. And the consequence of that results in a low serum phosphorus. And it's really this low serum phosphorus and the low 125D that have its effects. And this is just an example of bone tissue. Um, and this is normal bone tissue. And red is unmineralized bone and green is mineralized bone. And you can see normal bone has a little bit of unmineralized bone, but in F, the F panel here, this is an XLH mouse model with really bad unmineralized bone. Um, and the consequences of that are that the growth plates don't mineralize well, and so the growth plates get wider, and you'll hear your doctor talking about cupping or fraying in children. That's just stuff that we see on the radiology scan because of the way the mineral looks. And they get the bowed legs. Um, and so that sort of brings us full circle from originally having noticing kids who have had bowed legs and wouldn't respond to vitamin D to how they have high FGF23 levels and how FGF23 causes um, the disease in um, XLH. Now, there are some, uh, there may be some features that are not directly caused by FGF23 or by low phosphate levels. The trouble is we haven't ever had a really good animal model to do that because when you get rid of FGF23, you get a whole set of other problems um, that, uh, that are not clean. So the gene effects may do some other stuff, but how much of it is just due to FGF23 and phosphate and how much is due to other aspects of the gene are, are not completely clear. Um, and there's lots of research still going on. So Dr. Econ started talking some about how, uh, how we treat things. And this is an illustration um, that I decided I was tired of just hearing um, 
a leaky bucket explanation. I wanted to show people an, a leaky bucket explanation. So pretend this box is my bucket. There's a, a more you know picture of a bucket. But pretend this box is our bucket, and we have a we have water or phosphate that we want to get sort of in this sort of target range here. Um, but but we're low for some reason, and we're low because we're putting out too much phosphorus in the urine as a consequence of FGF23. So, well, so you even put more out because of FGF23. You always put some phosphate out. Our current treatment is like turning that, that up. So turning up the water to try to fill it faster. And so you do raise the phosphate level towards the normal range with this, but there's a consequence of that. The consequence is that you put out a whole bunch more um, in the urine and it makes it one harder to keep where you're supposed to go but it also means that if there's any problem with all that phosphate going through the kidneys to the urine, um, that we potentially increase the risk of those problems. And so I think that's actually really important. So current medical treatment addresses the low phosphorus in the low 125D because we're giving calcitriol or 125D and we're giving phosphorus salts. But as Dr. Econs has, has indicated, it doesn't address why they're low. It doesn't fix the leaky bucket. Um, and um, and so I think that's actually really important. And it is complicated. You have to take medicines multiple times a day. If you try to take it all at once, it doesn't work. Um, I mean, it doesn't work well enough. Um, and very frequent laboratory monitoring. Um, and depending on what phase we're in, we're sometimes monitoring between every, every month or every three months. Um, and because I learned from Dr. Econs, I tend to be more aggressive in, when I'm monitoring as well. And this is um, just an illustration, and this was first noticed um, by Francis Glorio uh, many years ago, um, which is that the phosphorus level fluctuates a lot between the doses each day. And so if this was a graph of um, where our phosphorus was, and this was one day, and this is another day, and this green, or it's blue on my screen, it looks green over there, um, uh, box is our target range, what we actually get is well, a little red thing that doesn't show up very well up there. Um, what we actually get is that the phosphorus level comes up and down. It goes into the normal range part of the time. And so that um, is, has some important implications potentially for the effectiveness of therapy. But it also um, reminds me to tell you that my goal is not to make their phosphorus normal. If you look at the literature, there are um, uh, the incidence of complications of therapy are reasonably high. And I think that they are higher in some of these papers than they could be because of um, too aggressive attempts to get the phosphorus into the normal range. And I'll show you why that is. So my goals are to improve the osteomalacia rickets, to basically try to make the legs straighter, to make the kids grow better, and to avoid complications. And again, my goal is not to normalize the phosphorus. And in fact, if the phosphorus is in the upper half of normal, I am decreasing the dose because I'm worried about causing problems. I don't mind if it, you know, I like it, it to be slightly low or just in the, you know, slightly into the normal range. Um, and again, that's for safety uh, purposes. So what are the risks? Dr. Econ's touched on some of these, but it's good to, to look at these again. The most common thing is that people have gastrointestinal side effects. They can get diarrhea, that's what that laxative effect issue is. Sometimes you get upset stomach, it doesn't taste very good. So, you know, those, those are all sort of very important effects. One thing that I've noticed is that my adults complain of diarrhea. My, the children and the parents of the children don't complain of diarrhea that much in my experience. That's not universal, but the children don't seem to, it doesn't seem to bother them as much as in adults, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. This overactive parathyroid gland, and Dr. Econ's told you that about half the time you'll have a little bit of overactive uh, parathyroid glands even before you start therapy. But the phosphorus can make the parathyroid glands overactive too, and some people, maybe some of you, have had to have surgeries for the parathyroid glands because they were causing your calcium to go out of control too. And that's just an added level of complexity. Um, they increase the amount of calcium, these are just big words to say, we're putting a lot of calcium in the urine, and we can actually make the calcium too high as well. The calcitriol increases how much calcium goes in the urine, and that can contribute to nephrocalcinosis. And so this is just a picture of a kidney uh, on an ultrasound that shows 
um, calcium deposits in the kidney. Now, for most people, that doesn't actually cause them too much trouble, but it can cause chronic kidney disease. And part of the reason I think these numbers in these papers are so high is because in years past, people use, would try to use even higher doses of phosphorus and calcitriol than what um, we and Tom Carpenter and most of us who are um, treating XLHS uh, uh, today um, would usually use. And exactly how often you get chronic kidney disease enough to need a transplant or dialysis is a little bit unclear. Um, I have seen one patient who had um, who came to me after having a transplant, um, and uh, and yeah, he's definitely proof that when you transplant a kidney, they still waste phosphorus in the urine, um, and so that's important. So what are the limitations of therapy? So these are really important too. Well, first off. This actually doesn't look all that much different from that graph at the very beginning um, when I showed you that um, XLH patients have higher FGF23 than controls, uh, normal patients. Well, it turns out that when you treat them with uh, calcitriol and phosphate, not only does it not fix the phosphorus, the phosphorus handling problem in the kidneys, but it actually increases the intact FGF23. Now, that's partly because there's this nice control loop to help regulate all hormones in the body. They all have a feedback system, um, and FGF23 is no different. And so calcitriol and phosphate both stimulate FGF23 production. And this is compared to patients who have XLH but are not treated. And it, but it's also very wide. This, this line going up just tells the doctors that there's a whole lot of variability in between patients and how much it goes up, as opposed to this little smaller line, which has less variability. Um, and here's the other limitation, and that is these two kids are the same age. They've been on treatment about the same amount of time, and you can tell that this one on the right is much more bowed and much shorter than this patient, although this patient still has some, still has some effects and some bowing, but um, her lower legs are, are pretty straight there. And so that's one of the big issues, is not only does, is there a lot of variability between patients in how they are affected from a skeletal standpoint, there's um, a lot of variability in how well they respond. And we don't have a good predictor of how well they respond at this point in time, other than watching them on treatment and seeing what happens. Now, something that really is useful for you guys is that there may be some benefits starting early. So... Um, there's a paper looking at starting before age two versus after age two, and this paper was before age one and after age one. And this, this red is sort of the normal range for heights in children, okay? And this is adjusted so that no matter what your age is, the normal range is gonna be between plus two and minus two with the average being zero. And you can see that those that were older than two in the white boxes compared to the ones in the gray boxes, they were shorter. So this just means that the at start of treatment, um, they were shorter for age than if they were uh, starting after one year old than if they started before one year old. And that if you started early, you preserved height better than if you started later. Now, there's a lot of overlap there and a lot of variability. And this isn't actually like um, what your doctor would like as a randomized trial. They didn't say, hey, this patient is, this patient's one, let's wait till they're three to start treating them. They, this is largely just based on when people presented to their doctor. And so if you have a kid, I think it's, I don't typically start treatment at one month of age or two months of age or three months of age, but I think it is reasonable somewhere around three to six months of age to get a phosphorus level and to get an alkaline phosphatase level and look at them according to child norms, which are both, for both of those, very different than adult norms, um, and, have, uh, and have that um, checked out. Um, by, you know, have that looked at by a doctor that knows something about XLH, I think that will actually help pick up people early. But as Dr. Econ said, there's really no clear consensus on when to treat adults. Um, and in general, most pediatricians that treat XLH stop treatment when people stop growing. Um, and, and that's because, like I said, many adults don't have much in the way of symptoms. But some do have symptoms and get bone pain and osteomalacia, which is just the cause of the bone pain, the poor mineralization uh, within the bone. Um, and some people are getting stress fractures or pseudo fractures. 
Um, and here's a patient who got fractures through the fibula there. And, um, and so these are all reasons to start patients on treatment. The other reason is even if they're not having symptoms, if somebody's getting a knee replacement, they're probably not going to heal up very well afterwards. And so that's a good time to put people on uh, back on treatment as well with full discussion of those risks and benefits, because I would rather not hurt anybody with the, with the treatment. Um, and it's a, I think it's a big commitment. And the other important thing is to our knowledge, calcitriol and phosphate don't fix the things that are actually the biggest source of complaints of uh, um, symptoms in adults. And so, um, we need some to look at some other directions and I'm not going to go in great detail for like what other future directions are, except to sort of illustrate sort of the mechanisms that are being looked at. And one is a set of mechanisms to decrease how much FGF23 is made. And the other is, well, can we just block um, what happens with FGF23? And so if you can imagine this envelope has lots of FGF23 in it, maybe one solution is to make it smaller. And so if we make it smaller, we can change to making more 125D than we were making before. We can change this green arrow to red and decrease how much phosphorus is in the urine. And the consequence of that is that the serum phosphate is going to increase um, closer to normal. Um, and um, one group has uh, done some studies with an agent in mice. And this is just to show you how that was looking. Um, if you take the hype mouse or the XLH mouse, their bones look really different than the normal mice. But if they gave them this medicine, this medicine that's not available for people, um, the bones got a lot better. They, they started to look a whole lot better. Um, and there's still some, you know, some questions with how well that would work, but and it's not in clinical trials at this point in time at all. But the other option is to block FGF23 action. So you could just put something in between FGF23 and its receptor to keep it from, uh, from acting. So if you did that, you have the same effects. You increase the 125D so you make more. You change the urine phosphorus so that you're putting less urine phosphorus um, out and you can improve the serum phosphorus. So one way that we've been involved with um, in uh, doing this, and I guess the proper disclosure is that our sponsor is also the same um, sponsor for this meeting is also the same sponsor that's actually doing the clinical trials um, with this particular agent. And that's with FGF23 antibodies. So you guys may have heard of antibodies. An antibody is something that the normal body makes. Um, it's an immune protein. Uh, and they help you fight infections and things like that. But medicine has also learned to take these proteins and this is just an, sort of what a the shape, rough shape of those immune proteins. We've learned to actually take those proteins and make them react to certain things, and produce them, in a um, produce them in a lab, and then give them to animals or give them to people. Um, and they don't necessarily affect. They shouldn't affect the immune system. They should, unless the immune system is the target, they should just affect whatever the protein is. So we can take these antibodies and make them so that they bind to a very specific target to use as a medical treatment, and there's lots of other medicines that do that. KRN23 is actually the name of an antibody that has been made to bind FGF23, and so it goes over, binds FGF23, and makes it inactive. So, um, and so we can give a medicine like that to mice, and it did improve the phosphorus, and it improved the calcitriol, or 125D, and it improved the bone. So this is the hype mouse bone, which looks like it doesn't have much mineral and it's shorter and disorganized a bit compared to the normal. And when the antibody was given, the mouse bones grew better and they mineralized better. Um, when we, this is just a slide from the published first uh, single dose paper. We, was, we published that last, uh, or I guess it's still just this year, but it's the beginning of the year. Um, TMP over GFR is just a measure of how your kidneys are handling phosphorus. And so in XLH, the TMP is low. And so the gray line here are the people who didn't get any medicine. And so it was low and it stayed low. And with all of the doses, the kidneys were increasing how much phosphorus they were keeping. Um, and so that's evidence that it was blocking FGF23 pretty effectively. Um, but when we, gave, uh, when we gave the medicine as well, this blood phosphorus level 
uh, got better. And this timeline is in days, and you can see that this goes out to 29, 50 days. So if the effect lasted instead of several hours, like your pill does when you take it, um, the medicine lasted for um, a few weeks at a time. And we have presented at the um, uh, national bone meetings um, some longer term studies in people. And this is, I'm just showing you the serum phosphorus level and each arrow is a dose. And so we, as we ramped up their doses, the blood phosphorus levels um, went up. Now this is all in adults. So um, many of them got up into the normal range, not all of them, but they all improved compared to baseline. And that effect was pretty sustained as we kept giving doses over time. This was just, this little dip down here is just because there was a gap in time during the middle of that study. And so we are actually right now enrolling um, children um, age 5 to 12 that aren't in puberty yet um, in a study um, in several sites um, around the world. Um, actually, we've been told to stop enrolling people right now to give somebody else a chance. So they, did, they thought everybody shouldn't be at two sites um, and the other sites are up and running. So we'll see what happens here. Um, but I'm hoping that there will be more studies. Um, and so for those of you who live nearby, um, if you keep an eye on the clinical, if, for those of you that live by that you know, see one of us around here, you'll probably hear about um, offers for additional studies if they come along. Um, but if you follow this uh, website down here and you live farther away, um, clinicaltrials.gov, any drug study in people has to be registered there. And so if you look at that periodically, um, you can always see if a new study has come along um, that, is, that is enrolling. And so I think that's important. So, um, and I'm going to just say that this summary is basically the summary of my title. FGF23 causes disease by affecting phosphorus. And um, the current therapy is calcitriol and phosphorus, and it deals with the consequences of FGF23 excess, but it doesn't fix the problem of FGF23 excess, and the effectiveness is quite variable. And we hope in future directions we'll be able to either block how FGF23 works or tell your body to make less FGF23. So I just say uh, thank you. So. Do we have any questions? Actually, I think we might even have more time for questions because there's a break after this, right? Yeah. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. I won't, we won't use up your whole break. We, and, and the other thing is during the breaks, if you know, we'll all be around to talk to and, and things like that. Any questions? Yeah, Bill. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible, if this is an unfair question, feel free to say so, that other members, adult members of the family might have mild strains of it? Well, because there's such variability, it is possible that, that they might um, not have had really bad bowing. Um, I think in some, when you were, Dr. Ekans was doing big family studies, I think they did find some adults who never knew they had it, if I remember properly. And because they, they might have been a little short, but their legs weren't all that bowed and they weren't having any symptoms and their doctors didn't know anything about it, so they didn't necessarily get found. Um, but that's pretty easily testable with the phosphorus level. Rather than doing a big gene test, I think I would just look at the phosphorus level, <laughs> um, in, uh, especially in the adults. For the most part, it's, I think it's not clear that untreated patients would get kidney stones. The nephro, there is a little bit of difference between what we call nephrocalcinosis, which is sort of calcium deposits in the kidney and kidney stones because they're sort of in different locations. Um, but at least for the calcium deposits in the kidney, it appears that if you've, not, if, you're, if you've never been treated that you don't get that problem. It seems to be a consequence of the treatment. Um, 
Although I would certainly say that if an adult who didn't know they were affected had a child that was affected, they're probably, you know, and they're in a family that they probably are carrying the gene in that situation. I did have something I wanted to make sure I remembered to talk to, and I forgot when I got to the treatment part, and that was, um, like I said, I treat both adults and kids. I haven't used Julie's solution in years. Um, for a while, I was trying to use Fleet's Phosphosoda, but that, I believe, has been taken off the market. Um, because it was dangerous when it was used as a laxative um, in an uncontrolled fashion. But the other thing I would say is that I don't know where the feedback's coming from. No, um, I also am not using the packets very often either. I, most of my, in the past few years, most of the little littles that I've treated, um, I've been able to use uh, approximate doses using half tablets of KFOS original and now you still have it's sort of similar to the packet still you still have to cut it and dissolve it um, and um, chocolate syrup is uh, what seems to have worked for a lot of my patients I for, for several of them they've done pretty well with juice or, or things like that but all these kids about age two just like they stop eating certain foods and suddenly decide I'm picky and I'm only eating chicken nuggets and macaroni um, about that age, they also start saying, I don't like this pill. And so there's, um, chocolate syrup has actually worked, um, very well for some of my patients. Not a lot, you know, a little bit of chocolate syrup. Um, I don't want to be the cause of a diabetes epidemic. Um, my, my boss here will fire me if I do that. <laughs> um, and, uh, the, uh, but also a lot of pharmacies, have uh, flavorings now for medicines, and so you, they could try different ones. Um, and uh, if they're not, if it's not immediately available in the um, in the shelves, it may be something to ask your pharmacist for. Do they have any flavors that you could just add to something like that? Um, and so that's worth trying too. Yeah. It's it's probably okay to get it. I mean, to go ahead, like if he misses it at lunchtime, just give it to him when he gets back home at school. And I mean, it's probably okay. Um, you wouldn't want to. It's it's works a lot better if you split it. If it's right. four doses, works better than three. And and then yeah, well, like I I, I find was well, certainly two doses a day is usually not effective enough from the phosphorus standpoint. Um, calcitriol I usually split out into two doses a day. Um, and then the phosphorus, I usually do either three or four doses a day if I can. Some people, some experts will do five doses a day of phosphate, like get people up in the middle of the night. Most of us don't do that. Um, and, um, and that's partly because it probably pushes the PTH a little bit. And so your other question about osteoporosis and osteomalacia. So, we talk about rickets, but rickets is what happens at the growth plate. Osteomalacia is the same process in the rest of the bone. The growth plate is just where you grow when you're growing. Osteomalacia is very different than osteoporosis. Osteomalacia is poor mineralization of the bone. Osteoporosis on a microscopic level is that you just not don't have enough bone. Um, that you don't either you don't have enough mineral or the protein. Whereas in osteomalacia you have a lot of the protein but not much mineral. Consequently, most it's a little bit complicated, but most XLH patients do not have osteoporosis. In fact, in XLH patients, the bone density, um, using a variety of different ways of measuring bone density, actually have slightly high normal bone density. That's not universal, but, but a lot of them, um, that if you get your, and, and if any of you are adults and have had your bone density checked, you might have seen this, that instead of being in the low range in the that same sort of zero being average and plus two being upper end of normal and minus two or minus 2.5 being the lower end of normal, a lot of XLH patients are in the plus one, plus two, maybe sometimes higher range, especially at the spine sometimes higher, but that's an artifact. My grandmother, who was not diagnosed until my son was diagnosed, mm -hmm. she's like in her 80s. Mm 
Mm. That, well, and, and like I said, it's not universal. Um, and there, and people would still be at risk for getting sort of other age related declines in bone density. The other really important thing is, um, is that the current medicines for osteoporosis, I would not give to a patient with XLH. I would especially not give to a child with XLH. Um, the, uh, because they don't make biological sense and they can actually worsen the osteomalacia. So I think that's important. Now, in older adults that might have osteoporosis index, I think it's more complicated and there's not, it would be more complicated. Hi. That's that's an early finding. So I didn't put that on there, but yeah, some kids will get crani craniosynostosis. Is um, do you remember I talked about growth plates? The skull has sort of growth plates. It has areas where the bone it's made of multiple bones, and it has, it has areas where they come together. Um, and if they um, fuse too early, then there's no room for the brain to grow, and it can cause problems. And so some kids do have enough changes in the skull from the from XLH that they do get craniosynostosis and have to have surgery. Um, it's not it's not most of them. Most of them don't end up having that. Um, but I have known of some kids who have had to have that done. Um, it is not a problem that typically develops later because um, normally the the bones all sort of fuse together, and so the sutures go away. So like you don't have you shouldn't have open sutures in your skull. So that's something that um, that during um, sometime during early childhood stops um, developing. So that's if if you, if they're treated, it probably isn't going to um, keep getting worse and can actually improve over time. Um, but I do know some adults who still have that because they just it just. I think there's variation in the response to there as well. Actually, I'm going to have another question over here. Yeah. Um, I had, my great grandma was born of vacuum leukemia, but they didn't. Uh, I was born with breast cancer, but I see a lot of myself, and I, after talking to myself, a lot of people like me who are sitting hunched over. No one else was born with that. My aunt was back, and she would always walk around with that. Do you have seen any CMAPs with people with XLH? That becomes a little bit more complicated because there are non-XLH disorders that will also cause that, and so and that are a thousand times more common than XLH, um, like which is a like osteoporosis itself actually does that, um, and so it's hard for me to tell just from that like did she have it necessarily? Um, I don't know specifically about being hunched over, but a lot of patients have back stiffness, and that relates to the some of the things that. Uh, Caroline's probably going to talk about with enthesopathy. Um, I'm actually wondering if uh, we should let you guys have your break and then we can talk for, like, if you guys have other questions, we can talk too. Just one more question. Okay. If, if a child has necrocalcinosis. Necrocalcinosis, okay. Is there a remedy? I decrease the doses typically. And does that? And they can improve. Um, so we. It's not permanent. It can be permanent, so it they um, it can improve. And uh, we well, one of the things we do is sometimes decrease the doses, but some, there are some other medicines we can add to sort of try to decrease the effect of the ex, so of the calcium in the kidney. That's what you're testing though. No, you're, children or adults can get nephrocalcinosis. Okay, the ultrasounds show that. The ultrasounds can be used to detect that. And then the treatment is. I, it's a balance, but we are often. I often end up reducing doses of calcitriol and phosphate in that situation, and sometimes I add another medicine that's uh, related to a blood pressure pill. Sometimes. Okay. A diet of. So sodium. 
restriction diet actually might have some effects on the calcium excretion in the kidney. So I could see why they would why they might do that. And and a lot of times once we find it, it doesn't really progress. So so I, I don't give you that to make everybody scared to death of nephrocalcinosis. I give you that to just remind that to remind us that um, it can happen and it can cause chronic kidney disease. And it's probably one of the biggest reasons why we don't just say all adults must stay on treatment. Because, um, because like I said, some adults are doing well and some are, some are not. And that's actually an important thing, um, you know, as you're at these uh, a meeting like this, is that you will see people who are more severely affected than you, or you might see people who are less severely affected than you. And so some people come and say, oh my goodness, um, some people are doing really bad. Is my kid going to be that severe? And it's not necessarily true. Um, because like I said, there's a very wide variability. So, well, we should let you guys uh, get out and uh, we'll, we'll all still be around to talk. So thanks.